Good morning. Welcome to First Unitarian Church, where our mission is to explore the eternal, nurture community, and pursue the common good. We welcome you in your brokenness and in your wholeness. No matter who you have been, who you are, or who you are becoming, we greet you today with love. We light the chalice as a symbol of our sacred time together. The burning chalice represents the light of reason and science, the warmth of loving community, the cleansing heat of justice, and the flame of hope. I want to welcome you to this service broadly oriented by the Buddhist tradition and brought to you by the participants in our Sunday morning meditation group. I call us to worship today with, the word, with words from Chip Roosh. We are about to enter sacred time. We are about to make this time and this place sacred by our presence and intention. Please turn off or silence your phones. And as you do so, I invite us also to turn down the volume on our fears, to remove our masks, and to loosen the armor around our hearts. Don't take my word for it. Do it as slowly as you need to. If you take a little risk with these good people, you may find that they have the same human needs as you do. Breathe. Let go of the expectations placed on you by others and those they taught you to place on yourself. Drop the guilt and the shame, not to shirk accountability, but an honest expectation of the possibility of forgiveness. Let go of the thing you said the other day. Let go of the thing you dread next week. Be here in this moment. Breathe here. I don't think I need anything for lunch. Our opening hymn is a- I think there's still a fish taco in there too, if you want to. I lost the screen when that person came on. Our opening hymn is a performance of the Heart Sutra by Yogetsu Akasaku. Akasaka with its famous paradoxical observation that form is emptiness and emptiness is form. I'll spare you the exegesis on that. Please just enjoy the song.
reading from Norman Fisher's When You Greet Me, I Bow. There's an old Zen story that I like very much. A monk comes to the monastery of the storied master Zhao Zhu. Diligent and serious, the monk asks for instruction, hoping for some esoteric teaching, some deep Buddhist wisdom, or at the very least, a colorful response that will spur him on in his practice. Instead, the master asks him, have you had your breakfast yet? The monk says that he has. Then wash your bowls, the master replies. This is the only instruction he is willing to offer. Although the Zen master's response might seem gruff, odd, and cryptic, it actually makes a fundamental point. Zhao Zhu wants to bring the monk back to the immediate present. Don't look for some profound Zen instruction here, he seems to be saying. Open your eyes. Just be present with the actual stuff of your ordinary, everyday life. In this case, bowls. Like the monk in the story, I came to the San Francisco Zen Center years ago with huge metaphysical concerns. A student of literature, philosophy, and religion, I was full of questions about what was real, what was right, what was enlightenment, what was consciousness. The world I had inherited from my parents, in which so much was taken for granted, no longer seemed tenable. Everything was up for grabs. I came to the Zen Center propelled by the spirit, and I was willing to go to almost any length, do anything, meditate, read texts, practice austerities, listen to lectures, to answer my all-consuming questions. But my questions seemed to have little to do with Zen as it was presented to me. Instead of engaging in study and discussion, the only modes of discovery I knew at the time, I learned how to mop the floor, wash the dishes, tend the garden. Actually, it was exactly what I needed. As this experience grounded me, my metaphysical concerns began to be settled. The answers I was looking for were not to be found in spiritual teachings, enlightenment flashes, or meditative states, although there were enough of these over the years to keep me going. Little by little, through tending to the daily life of the temple, I began to breathe and feel my answers bodily instead of knowing them intellectually. The word Zen means meditation, and meditation is certainly the best known Zen practice. But meditation is not merely spiritual contemplation. In the Soto Zen tradition I follow, teachers continually stress the actual mechanisms of sitting on the cushion. The instruction is so physical, so specific, that one might well wonder when the Zen part begins. But this is the Zen part to pay attention to the body in all its details, to be present with the body in its physical immediacy. This is the practice, and the depth of the practice derives from it. And now, our worship associate, Stephen Melch. Good morning. Here are some reflections on retirement, or ideas about letting go and facing new challenges. I first want to thank Paul and Lori for conducting our meditation group all these Sundays on Zoom. It has helped me to become more reflective on what is most meaningful and brings me the most satisfaction as I continue my transition into retired life. I've been a member of this church for almost 25 years and have participated formally and informally in countless ways. The 10 o'clock meditation group, which numbers, oh, just around 10 people, uh, has been one of my most treasured activities. So we begin. I originally thought retirement would be an easy life transition for me. I now look back and realize I had some a great deal of uh, anxiety over the economics of retirement. I started my Social Security 15 years ago at 62, which allowed me a small but regular check from the government. I have no other pensions. Fortunately, I was gifted in the area of 
personal real estate, which has allowed me uh, to um, a level of economic security and the ability to make choices and therefore dissipating any fears that I might have living without means. In letting go of maybe half of our material possessions, Deborah and I downsized houses last year. Having lived in the same location for 17 and a half years, we had accumulated so much stuff. Uh, <clears throat> I had my doubts whether we could part with it or just get rid of it. I refer to uh, now our new home as my last resting place. No more moves. And I am at peace with that. How much more time do I have on this earth? I have no idea. What I do know is that I have made a lifelong commitment with myself for seeking social justice and equality. I began in the 60s as a civil rights worker in the South and presently working with my fellow residents, organizing an in environmental effort in our community of Hawthorne Village. I started out this retirement journey volunteering at several agencies and organizations, sort of testing things out. Most were not a fit, and therefore I moved on. Retirement has taught me that I personally need meaningful connections and meaningful activity, thus allowing me to make a contribution, but also provide a soulful sense of meaning. Work has taken me to the, uh, to the ghettos of Atlanta, Georgia and San Francisco, uh, placed me in front of thousands of students and clients in college classrooms and, and with mental health hospitals and clinics. The circle has come around again as I have returned to my great love of challenging the status quo. I'm hopeful that our group will succeed as I plan to put as much effort into it as I, I can uh, in terms of my health and energy. What have I found out about retirement and myself? One, first I need to come away uh, with, with an activity uh, that gives me a sense of satisfaction and a feeling that uh, uh, of um, effort that has existential meaning. Second, I need to keep in touch with my feelings and thoughts in reference to my purpose here on this planet. And finally, third, through reflection, yoga and meditation, I've come to understand what direction is the right one for me to travel in this existence. Thank you. Good morning, I'm Larry Little, cisgender ally with pronouns he, him, his, a member of Laura Lochner's book club and Lori and Paul's Sunday morning meditation group, a board of trustees representative, one of several first Unitarian delegates to the most recent UUA General Assembly and supporter of all of the good works of this beloved congregation. Every Sunday we take an offering since 2002, all the cash and designated checks from that offering have gone directly to external nonprofit organizations doing good work in our community, our Change for Change partners. This month, our Change for Change partner is Freedom Oklahoma. Freedom Oklahoma works to secure lived equality and legal protection for lesbians, gays, bisexuals, transgender, queer, and questioning people through advocacy, public education, coalition building, and empowerment in the civic process. You may wish to make your donation using a credit card through our website, or this could be a good time to find your checkbook, write out a check, and put it aside to mail to First Unitarian on Monday morning. 
Let today's offering reflect our highest aspirations for the work of this church in the world. We will now have a brief silent meditation following the instructions of Dojin, a 13th century Japanese monk and founder of the Soto Zen lineage in Japan. This introduction is from his fascicle on seated meditation, known as Zazen. He instructs, stop searching for phrases and chasing after words. Take the backward step and turn the light inward. Your body and mind of themselves will drop away and your original face will appear. If you want to attain just this, immediately practice just this. For Zazen, a quiet is appropriate. Drink and eat in moderation. Let go of all involvement and let myriad things rest. Do not think good or bad. Do not judge right or wrong. Stop conscious endeavor and analytic introspection. Place the right hand palm up on your lap and then the left hand on the right hand with the ends of the thumb lightly touching each other. 
Sit straight up without leaning to the right or left and without bending forward or backward. The ears should be in line with the shoulders and the nose in line with the navel. Rest the tongue against the roof of the mouth with the lips and teeth closed. Keep the eyes open and breathe gently through the nose. Having adjusted your body in this manner, take a breath and exhale fully. Then sway your body to the left and the right. Now sit steadfastly and think not thinking. How do you think not thinking? Non-thinking. This is the essential art of Zaza. We will now remain in seated meditation for just a couple of moments. One of the things that Lori and I learned in the course of doing the online meditation is how difficult it is to get a bell that works via Zoom. So <laughs> excuse us for not bringing you out more subtly than that. Um, if you are like me, even that brief meditation proved difficult and the injunction, injunction to, not, to think not thinking impossible. I am so accustomed to moving about both mentally and physically that the practice of Zazen literally just sitting in silence is often the exact opposite of what I think I want to be doing. After years of intermittent practice, however, I've come to really appreciate the opportunity to slow down and observe the present moment. As the saying popularized by Sylvia Borstein goes, don't just do something, sit there. When the pandemic struck, I noticed the reduction in busyness almost immediately. Meetings and travel were abruptly canceled, and my days opened up. Once it became clear that we would still be able to get food and would be relatively safe at home, I began to take some interest in the spaces that were now available in my life. I was finally able to indulge my afternoon drowsiness with naps, and I generally only had one to two relatively urgent matters to attend to on any given day. With the loss of sports, at least until midsummer, I also had the time to read much more widely than I had in years. And I soon found myself, found my way to the online offerings of the Upaya Zen Center in Santa Fe, founded and still led by Joan Halifax. I began to sit more and inevitably, I found myself wondering what all that running had been about. We tend to value busyness for busyness's sake, as if the mere act of maintaining all those balls in the air was the goal of life itself. I once heard someone say that grant-like writing is like a cake eating contest where the prize is more cake. I think the same thing applies to busyness. What is the reward for keeping all those balls in the air? If anything, just more balls. That I discovered when I let the balls drop is a poor excuse for meaning and purpose. With our daughter now graduated from the school district she started kindergarten in when we moved here in 2008, and all of her grandparents having passed on over that same interval, I have had multiple occasions to realize the truth of what always seemed to me such a trite observation when I was younger. Time really does fly. And the pause in my busy striving that the pandemic forced upon me has me realizing that part of the reason for time's quick passage is how little I have been engaged in my life. To be sure, I've been involved in worthy projects over this time, but I've so often been so distracted by the pursuit of the next bright, shiny new object that I seldom paused to pay attention to the gifts I had already received, nor to appreciate the life they had created for me to inhabit. 
I used to think that if I stopped striving, I would end up doing nothing more than sitting around and watching TV. But my experience during the pandemic has shown me an alternative. Having survived my most recent life crisis, I know that I can no longer be anything I want to be, nor can I do anything I set my mind to. And this awareness of my limits has forced me to honestly reflect on who I have become as a result of all that striving. Richard Rohr has an intriguing idea in his book, Falling Upward, where he suggests that we spend the first half of our life building a strong container, by which he means something like our identities and capabilities, and the second half finding the contents that container was meant to hold. When I first encountered the idea, I thought it made no sense. I thought I was very much still in the midst of building towards something else, very aware of my imperfections, and it honestly had not occurred to me that I had already become something perhaps even the something I was, in some sense, meant to be. While I don't share Richard Rohr's sense of a solid self, I'm too influenced by Buddhism, psychoanalysis, and cultural theory to go there completely, I do very much like the idea that the task of the second half of life is to make something of what we have become. Not in the sense of striving for more, but rather in the sense of an appreciative engagement with the work that remains, perhaps the work that only we can do. The Buddhist tradition has an idea, no doubt familiar to almost everyone, that suffering is inevitable. The word commonly translated as suffering, dukkha, can also mean something more like unsatisfactoriness, which I have come to think of as that sense of restlessness that has fueled so much of my striving. What I've discovered in the pause that the pandemic provided to me in my 50s is that taking satisfaction in the life I have, appreciating and savoring it for what it is, does not mark the end of my work, but rather in some sense, the beginning. In his book, Open to Desire, the Buddhist psychoanalysis analyst, Mark Epstein notes that contrary to what we might expect, the Buddhist tradition does not always recommend that we abandon all desire. Although there is certainly enough medieval monasticism in the tradition that you could certainly go that way too, if you want it. Rather, he suggests that the task is to come to a new relationship with our desires one that recognizes that our satisfaction does not lie in getting the thing we want, but rather in the realization that we will never get what we want and that we might well find a way to be comfortable with, open to, in his terms, that fact. As I look back on the pattern of my life, especially with regard to my work, I see a set of themes that have consistently engaged me and shaped the projects I have pursued and which have led me to where I now am. And in the pause that the pandemic provided, I've been able, as Parker Palmer puts it, to let my life speak. I'm in no place to articulate fully what it is telling me. I think that is an emerging product of my dialogue with life, nor would I think a public sermon broadcast to the world would be the place to do that. But what I have found is a renewed interest in that question, which Mary Oliver phrased so nicely at the end of her poem, The Summer Day, what will you do with your one wild and precious life? In the reading, Norman Fisher emphasizes the value of attending to our being in the world as the path to enlightenment. The pandemic has provided me with more time to pay attention to the experience of doing a smaller number of things, including cleaning the house. I have found the pleasures in being able to mindfully engage in the work before me and the opportunity I now have to make choices about what to take up. These choices are now better informed by an appreciation of the life I already have rather than the one I kept planning to get. My recourse to Norman Fisher in this service is hardly accidental. Recently in our Sunday morning meditation group, we listened to a Dharma talk he gave, where he emphasized the importance of appreciating the life we actually have. In a line that will likely be with me for the rest of my life, he suggested that maybe enlightenment is simply having nothing left to prove. The relentless pursuit of more and more things to do left me distracted, depleted, and frustrated. The pandemic has given me the opportunity to reevaluate all this doing, not to retreat into a life of just sitting, although a prolonged practice period is certainly something I hope to find time to do, but to be more deliberate and intentional about the projects I, I pick up and to be more fully present and engaged with those that I do. This is, I should say, a far different place from where I thought my interest in Buddhism would take me. I first encountered the Buddhist tradition through a general education class I took as an undergraduate at the University of Michigan now decades ago, and I have retained a long-term interest in the idea of Buddhism since then. 
But it was only after Elizabeth Demansky, known to some of you, I'm sure, started the meditation group here that I began to commit myself to the practice of meditation. And what I have learned in the course of this is that the practice is much less about withdrawing from life and much more about immersing myself in it, even if that means increasing my chances to actually experience the difficult feelings of sadness and fear. The philosopher Todd May has an intriguing analysis of vulnerability and invulnerability in his recent book, A Fragile Life. In that book, he contrasts approaches like Stoicism and Buddhism, which he argues pursue invulnerability to suffering as an organizing goal, with an understanding that caring about and committing oneself to a meaningful life will inevitably open us up to suffering. In the end, he concludes that most of us likely do not want to pay the full price involved in attaining invulnerability to suffering, even as almost all of us want to reduce the extent to which we suffer over trivial things. I think this is a wonderful description of the path of a householder like me. I have spent my life pursuing all sorts of disparate things. In the course of that, I have created the life I currently inhabit. The pandemic and my deepening practice of meditation and mindfulness has given me the opportunity to pause some of that striving to see what matters most in the work before me and what projects I truly want to commit myself to. While this likely opens me up to the suffering that I first came to Buddhism to escape, I think I'm okay with that as long as I have taken the time to discern what projects I actually want to commit myself to. This has already been a somewhat meandering talk informed by, as I said, the space I've had to read and listen more widely over the past 16 months. So let me close with just one more thought. I recently had the pleasure of listening to the book Dedicated, read by the author Pete Davis. He mentioned early on that his father was an applied anthropologist, a term that I have come to accept as a description of my own work as well. I had a brief exchange with Pete about this over Twitter and was able to track down some of his father's work. While that connection is interesting, more relevant from my perspective is the lesson that Pete says he learned from his father about the importance of dedication and commitment to one's life's projects, which he contrasts with our current preoccupation with what he calls infinite browsing. The title of his book, Dedicated, captured my imagination in the context of the struggles I've just summarized for you here. My pre-pandemic self was constantly in pursuit of the next thing, always looking for more, so quite loosely attending to whatever I was presently engaged in. I think what I discovered when I slowed down to listen was the value of the choices and commitments I had already made and the importance of living into those. After all, if there is one lesson I have learned in midlife, it is the impossibility of going back in time. I am a product of the choices I have made for whatever reason I made them. And an enthusiastic embrace of the consequence of these choices and a decision to move forward from there is, I think, a much better place to be than locked into the constant pursuit of something else. Our closing hymn is All Will Be Well by Meg Barnhouse.
We extinguish the flame, but not the light of love and community, which burns in our hearts. As a reminder, please join us at coffee hour shortly after the end of this service. And as a reminder, that link is separate from the link you're using for the service now. Our benediction is from Eric Williams. Blessed is the path on which you travel. Blessed is the body that carries you upon it. Blessed is your heart that has heard the call. Blessed is your mind that discerns the way. Blessed is the gift that you will receive by going. Truly blessed is the gift you will become on the journey. May you go forth in peace. Sorrow.